But we're going to see pride in action. There's a lot of things that can produce pride in the heart of man, and tonight we're going to see one of those. And so uh, we, we learned about King Amaziah, uh, the king of Judah, last time. And, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and it says in verse 17 of 2 Kings 14, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of jo- Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, 15 years. And the rest of the acts of Amaziah are then not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah. And we looked at that. Now, verse 19, Now they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and slew him there. And they brought him on horses, and he was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. Okay, so in verse 21, now we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're staying focused on the kings of Judah for just a minute. We're going to go back to Jeroboam the second, but we're going to look at a... Uh, uh, not Ahaziah, Azariah, okay? And, and you probably don't, you probably not recognize that name, Azariah. But <clears throat> he's also called Uzziah, and that one is much, much more common. So same guy, different names, all right? Verse 21, all the people took, of Judah took Azariah, which was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. He built Elath, and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. Well, that's not much. Two verses. And then we're, we're going to talk about Jeroboam the second. But because we can turn over to Second Chronicles chapter 26, and the chronicler is going to take us much deeper into the life of <clears throat> this king. And so turn with me there. Second Chronicles chapter 26 says, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. So, <clears throat> Azariah, 2 Kings 14, 21, and Uzziah, 2 Chronicles 26, 1, same guy. Okay, And if you take his name apart, what it has to do with is... is The strength of the Lord. One of the names means the strength of the Lord. The other name means the Lord is my strength. And so, so it's it's basically two ways of saying the same thing, Um, and it's kind of a it's kind of a play on words. And I, uh, what I want to do is I want to say he's called Azariah before the stupid thing that he does, and then looking back on him, he's called Uzziah. But I don't know that that's the case. Okay, but nonetheless. It's all about his name. His name means the Lord is my strength. Okay, and so so he was 16 years old when he became king. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. That's a long time. That's longer than Solomon. That's longer than David. So 52 year reign. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. So this is a good king. He has a long reign, and he's a builder. Okay, now that's that's exciting because this guy is he's uh, ambitious. He's a nationalist. He wants to build up everything around him, and we're going to see that in his life. And if you were to go to Israel today, they could take you to some ruins, and they could show you that level right there. Uzziah is responsible for that. Okay, So it says in verse 5, And he sought God. Isn't that exciting? He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Who does that remind you of? You remember King Joash? Remember the old priest? He was six years old when he became king, and he did that which was right until the priest died. As long as the priest was alive, he did that which was right. And when that priest died, he took the counsel of some other people, and he did some horrible things idolatrous things after the death of the priest. Well, Uzziah is very similar. There is a guy in his day, and his name is Zechariah. Now, this isn't the writer of Zechariah in your Bible, the prophet. He's not, he's not going to come until later. But we're going to have a king named Zechariah. We're going to have 
this prophet named Zechariah. We're going to have another prophet named Zechariah and another prophet named Zechariah. So Zechariah was kind of the Susie Q of their day. It's a very, very popular name. Okay, So this is a prophet. He stands beside the king. He is a, a, a counselor to the king. And when you have a 16-year-old king, he probably needs some help. And this man helped him greatly. And he was a godly man. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And so it's, we're going to read about all this. He says he went forth and he warred against the Philistines. Break down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabnia, the wall of Ashdod, and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. So he's, he's taking dominance over these ancient enemies of Israel, the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gurbael and the Mehunims. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. That's what you're going to see. His name means God is my strength. He strengthened himself. He is successful as a military uh, in his military campaigns, uh, and God is helping him to have victory in these situations. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate. So he's beefing up his own defenses. And when you have a wall, you put a tower on it, and that tower is a defensive position uh, for you. And so it says uh, uh, at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall, and he fortified them. So he's, he's getting ready to be able to defend his position before the State of the Union address. Our president erected fences all around the Capitol to make sure that nobody could get in there and hurt him while he was saying what he said. Verse 10, Also he built towers in the desert, and he digged many wells. For he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also, and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel. For he loved husbandry. When I, was, when I got my degree from, animal, uh, from Texas Tech, anyway, really irritates me on the Cowboy Channel. Anytime an Aggie runs the barrels, they play the Aggie fight song when she rounds the last barrel and heads back. But the Red Raiders, they don't do that for them. So I decided that on my Cowboy Channel, I was going to... Anyway, I was teasing. But my degree is in animal production. But when my dad got a degree, it was called animal husbandry. And so, so that is a, a funny word, husbandry. It doesn't mean you're the husband of animals. It means that you are the caretaker of animals. So Uzziah is, he's, he's kind of like, you know, who does, you tell me, who does Uzziah remind you of so far? He's a cross between David and Solomon, I think. He's a warrior king, but he's also a builder. And he loves agriculture. And so he's... He, he owns lots of cattle. He's involved with the vine dressing and with, with crops. And so it says that uh, <clears throat> uh, he loved husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jael, the scribe, and Maaseah, the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. So this is his special military that he's got. So not only is he a builder, he's building these cities. He's also an agriculturalist. He's building up the agriculture of the land. He is also involved in really beefing up his military. Okay, And so it says the whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. So like David, he has this contingency of mighty men, a special forces that, that are his, his personal guard. And under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. So he's got a massive army. He's got a well-trained army. He's got a special contingent of army in the midst of, you know, the, the army. You've got the, 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 the regular army, and then you've got the special forces. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields and spears and helmets, and habergeons and bows and slings to cast stones. So he's he's just a he's a planner. You know, he's sitting there and he says, if we gotta go to war, what's it gonna take? Well it's gonna take a big military and it's gonna take a well stocked military. We can't run out of 
weapons. We've got to make sure we've got enough. And not only that, but we have to defend our capital, which is Jerusalem. So he beefs up the capital and beefs up security there. The guy's wise. He's smart. He's a builder. Every time you, there, There's people like this. You might know somebody. You might be like this. There's people who move in somewhere, and when they leave, it looks like a wreck happened. And there's other people who move in somewhere, and when they leave, it's better than they, than they came in. They, they build stuff. They, they, they change the floors. They add a porch. They, they do something. That's Uzziah. He's a builder. Everywhere he goes, he's like, we should build a city over there. You know, we should build up this army. You guys need better weapons. You need, you need more advanced technology. Not only that, but he's going to really beef up the city of Jerusalem. So not only does he provide these, these hand-to-hand weapons for his soldiers and for uh, their, their armor, but it says in verse 15, And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. Now, now this, is, this is fascinating to me because uh, I don't know if you've ever, some of you guys might enjoy these, but trebuchets, catapults, uh, crossbows, giant crossbows. That's what this is. He says these were these are, are siege engines invented by cunning men. So he's got he's got engineers that work for him, and he says, "Look, guys, on the on the walls of the city, what we should do is not only just have our men up here, but we need a catapult that can throw something way off over there." And so it says that that these were to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, there's a there's a show. There's these British guys, and they do really dumb things, but they they catapult a Volkswagen, and it is it is awesome. They build this just ancient catapult that works off of a counterbalance, so they don't use any modern technology with it. And they take an old Volkswagen and they throw it through a barn. It goes much farther than they they actually thought it was going to. But what's fascinating about it is, is they build this thing. And, you know, MythBusters, those guys, they do, they build this kind of stuff. So he says, he says, uh, and his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Who was he helped by? He was helped by God. Remember, that's what his name means. That's what this boy is named. When they name this boy, Yahweh, Jehovah, is my strength. That's his name. And God has strengthened him. He strengthened the country. He strengthened the army. He strengthened his mighty men. He strengthened the city of Jerusalem. He strengthened the agriculture, the, the production of the people, the, the, the lifeblood of your people. His people aren't going to go hungry. He's got something to trade. He's, he's wiping out the enemies that are on, on both sides of him. But as he gets strong, his head inflates the whole time. And, and so it says, But when he was strong, verse 16, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. And, and I, I, that's, why, that's why I put these two verses up here. You know, I, I tease with, with people sometimes that you can't walk into a school without walking past the pride sign. Chicken hawk pride, right? Whatever it is. <laughs> the golden, golden green chicken hawk pride. I went to school at Roswell High. Coyote pride. I'm so proud of that, proud of that, proud of that, proud of that. There is not one good word about pride in the Bible. Not one. And yet our culture operates on it. You are supposed to be proud of you. Proud of this, proud of that, proud of this, proud of this, proud of your accomplishments, proud of this, proud of this, proud of this, proud of proud. And God says, I oppose the proud, but I give my grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And this is a wonderful study. This is a guy that you would admire. When you think about King Uzziah, you would admire this man. You would look at this man, you would say, this man is incredible. He took what he inherited from his father as a 16-year-old boy with a with a priest, I mean, a, a prophet for a counselor at his side, and he built everything his hand touched. He improved it. He made Jerusalem great again. <laughs> He made, he made the, I mean, that's what he did. He, 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 everything he touched, he built up. But where did the strength come from? Where did the help come from? The help comes from God. And God, and, and let's go back to, uh, let's see, where did it say it? Verse 5, he sought God 
in the days of Zechariah. Remember what, what Matthew says. Matthew 6.33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So in the days that he was seeking God, in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And God helped him. But there came a point, apparently, when he stopped seeking the Lord. And it was because he got to the point that he said, Look what I did. I'm strong. I did this. Can you think of another king who did that? King Nebuchadnezzar. There came the day that King Nebuchadnezzar, he walked out there and he stood on the corner of his palace and he looked at all the kingdom as far as his eye could see in either direction was all of his. Not only the people, but the animals. They belonged to him. They submitted to him. And he was puffed up with pride and he bowed his chest up and he said, all of this belongs to me. And God struck Nebuchadnezzar and he turned him into an ox. He literally took his mind away from him. He went insane. They turned him out to pasture. The guy loped around on all fours and ate grass. His hair grew. His fingernails grew like claws. He slept outside. He woke up in the morning covered with dew and went back to eating grass for seven years to humble him. And at the end of that time, God said, what do you think now, Nebuchadnezzar? And he said, oh, the Lord, he, he's God. He's God over all the earth, right? Well, you, that's what Uzziah did. Same thing when he was strong. And so Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It, it, is, it is a universal thing, and we see it all through Scripture. <clears throat> Pride can come from a lot of different sources. But one of the things I want you to remember is, is that pride is the sin of the devil. The devil, in his pride, challenged God. Let's look at that real quick. Um, first, let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. <clears throat> and it says... Verse 11, Isaiah 14, 11, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And so, so that, that pride in an angel caused him to fall. Well, the Bible tells us here, it says, verse 16, When he was strong, his heart was lifted up, to his destruction. Proverbs 29, 23, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. So there is the contrast. Pride versus humility. This one doubles up. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So, so a haughty spirit is compared with pride. This one is the opposite. Pride versus humility. And so, so what did he do? Well, let's, let's look at it. When he was strong. When he was strong. You know, strength is something that we value. Strength is something we look for, especially in a leader. I mean, gosh, this, this is what we want, isn't it? I mean, we're looking at this frail, possibly demented fellow that is our current president, and we're embarrassed by him. I am. I don't know about you. I am. I know the rest of the world is sitting here looking, just going, you got to be kidding me, and you're going to run him again? It's, it's unthinkable is what it is. It's insane. But what's, what's the, the, the opposite of that is this strength and this danger of your strength causing you to become proud. 
And so in his strength, he was, his heart was lifted up to destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. And he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And so Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and they said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth. And had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So, so it's, it's not, no one is, is permitted to burn incense in the temple except the priests. That's their job. So you got the king, you got the priests, you've got prophets, different offices, uh, and they don't, they don't crisscross, right? And so he just decides one day in his pride, well, gosh, I've built everything else up around here. I guess I'll just go in there and burn some incense in the temple too. And you know what? I bet, I bet that he was thinking, I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to show how much I love the Lord. I'm going to go in there and burn incense. Problem is, is God said, nobody but the priest is supposed to do this. Okay. And so the, the priest Azariah, he gets after him. No, you can't do that. And uh, by the way, <clears throat> that priest's name is Azariah, A Z A R I A H, and uh, that's his name too. And that may be another reason why he's called Uzziah to distinguish him from the high priest. So you got a high priest and a king who have exactly the same name at the same time. <laughs> Talk about confusing, right? So that may be why uh, they called him Uzziah. Took and turned the, the, the name around a little bit. Nonetheless, Azariah, the chief priest, verse 20, And all the priests looked upon him. Behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. And there's no doubt about this in their minds. It's very visible, and it's immediate. Can you imagine? And it says it broke out on his forehead first. And so this white, scaly skin, dry, uh, just, just, and then just begins to spread. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death. And he dwelt in a several house being a leper. In other words, he didn't dwell in the palace. He, he, they, they had put him out somewhere else. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So what you're going to have for the rest of his life he reigns 52 years as the king, but for a large portion of that, he is removed from the population because of his leprosy. And his son basically is the, a co-regent, and he serves as a judge, basically a proxy for his father during that period of time. And so it says, verse 22, Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. For they said he is a leper, and Jotham his son reigned in his stead. And so it's a, it's a fantastic study. It's a great reminder, uh, and, and it's a hard one. This one is hard because this one, this one goes against your culture. Your culture says that... That pride is actually a good thing. Your culture flaunts pride. It promotes pride. Your culture calls it something else. It calls it self-esteem. But if you're not careful, pride, and it's so subtle too. Several of the, of the things that, that, that produce pride, we, we see strength being one of them here. Uh, athletics, you know. The stud duck. It's real easy when you're the stud duck to be proud. I mean, when 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 you're when you're the high scoring guy or the the fastest girl or the you're the big hitter on the volleyball team or you can rope the calves faster than somebody else or whatever your game is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't take long before people start. And and by the way, it's not just you. Other people help with this. 
You're the best there is. You're the greatest we've ever seen. You're the GOAT. Gosh, we've got, we've got a commercial about it. Optimum's commercial with Derek Jeter is all about the GOAT. You're the greatest that's ever lived. You know, and, and pretty soon that, that stuff starts to go to your head. But I'll tell you another one. Here's another one. Beauty. Beauty. Pretty people. Doesn't take them long for pretty people to, to go, well, boy, it's hard. It's hard not to look at me when I walk in the room. Yeah. Uh, successful people. Rich people. People who are successful at their job or their business or whatever it, it, it after a while and when you become strong in that and and there is this great temptation and listen if you don't think that you're susceptible to it you're crazy because we all are and it is so subtle and and satan he loves this one because he's fallen to it he knows all about it he also knows that god opposes it and so so if he can produce pride in your life if he can tempt you to allow whatever it is and so so you got to be careful with success just think about this how many successful people have been able to stay out of the trap of drugs business athletics uh, the entertainment industries how many of them have been able to stay out of that boy it doesn't take long before you feel like you're above the law above other people and and it's such a it's such a horrible horrible trap and so i just want to encourage you tonight let's go back to second kings for just a minute i want to show you something else that is uh <clears throat> fascinating so so second kings 14 we we read those two verses then we're going to jump to jeroboam we're going to skip over jeroboam the second um, well, no, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're going to go back to verse 23. So I want to show you this before. Next time we'll talk about Jeroboam. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and one years. Now, remember, the first king of Samaria, it wasn't called Samaria, but the first king of Israel, his name was Jeroboam. He's the one who built the golden calves. So this is Jeroboam the second. Okay. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. That's Jeroboam the first, the son of Nebat. This is Jeroboam the second that we're talking about. And he's going to be just like all the rest of the kings of the north. He's going to be an idolater. He's going to, to uh, worship at the golden calves. Verse 25, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath, Unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amity. So, this is Jonah. This is the writing prophet Jonah. is alive at this point in time. So, when you have Jeroboam II and Uzziah, that's when Jonah prophesies. And what we have here is a prophecy from Jonah that we don't have recorded in the book of Jonah. So... So it says that, that he was able to be victorious and to restore this eastern boundary up against Syria to take some of these, these uh, uh, lands back. Uh, and this is, this is Jeroboam. Then, if you'll go down to chapter 15 real quick with me, it says, In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. This is Uzziah. We just read about him in Second Chronicles. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. <clears throat> he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death dwelt in a several house, and Jotham, the king's son, was over the house, judging the people of the land. And the rest of the acts of Azariah and all he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the king of Judah. So Azariah slept with his fathers, they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham, his son, reigned in his stead. So, so you've got these, these parallel accounts, that shouldn't surprise us. We have repetitive things in Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. We have repetitive things here in Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. We have repetitive things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
So, so God is, is giving us multiple witnesses to these things. The chronicler goes deeper into the kings of Judah. Uh, the, the book of Kings only focuses, well, it doesn't only, it, it goes back and forth, but it glosses over. It just like skipping a rock. It just kind of lets us in on a little bit. But what I wanted to show you is, is that during this time, this is when the prophet Jonah prophesies, and this is when the prophet Isaiah prophesies as well as Micah. And so we're going we're gonna to see uh, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, and Jonah are all, they're all coming onto the scene here. Now, here's what's interesting. Up to this point in time, the primary prophets have either been minor, nameless, or Elijah and Elisha, right? After Samuel. It's kind of Elijah, Elisha, and we learn a lot about those guys. But the other prophets are, well, like that Zechariah. I mean, we just, he's a counselor to the king, but we don't know a whole lot about him, right? But at this point in time, we're starting to get the writing prophets. And so what you're seeing is, is from here on, you're going to see God begin to turn the volume up. And I don't, I don't know how else to explain it other than that. Uh, Elijah was instrumental in the beginning of the destruction of Baal worship in Israel. Elisha came and through him and Jehu, Baal worship is basically wiped out in Israel. Now we're going to begin to see God begin to call both houses, the north and the south, back to God. Because Jonah is going to prophesy to the north but Micah and Isaiah, they're going to be prophets primarily. They're going to prophesy to both, but they're primarily prophets to, to Judah and Jerusalem. Isaiah is going to live in Jerusalem. He's going to be in that area. Okay, And so, so a, as you see this, I think what you see is, is God's mercy as he's saying, he, he's getting louder. He's been, he's been calling them back. And he's had a few kings that have, have brought about some revivals a little bit. But now God is sending these prophets and we're going to have a whole lot more information about God and what he's telling them during this period of time. So I'm trying to decide from this point in time on just how deep into those prophets we go as we study this. I think what we're going to do is just kind of mention them as we go on and go all the way through 2 Kings and 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 the Chronicles because we're kind of doing those at the same time and then when we get to the end of that then we'll go and we'll look at what some of the prophets had to say I think is the best way to to do that but um, this is my this is my encouragement to you tonight uh, what I see here as we read this is I see God's mercy Romans 15 4 whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope as we look at this, we see the wickedness of these some of these kings. We see the these sins. And God has given us this to warn us. Beware of pride. Guard your heart against pride. Uh, study out pride. Look at, look at it and think about it in your life. Because let, let's, let's look at the, the verse in James and then we'll, uh, we'll be done. James chapter 4. <clears throat> It says, uh, verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. And let us turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. He tells us there, Likewise, ye younger, verse 5, 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility. Now think about who's saying this. This is Peter saying this. Be clothed with humility. You know, there came a day when Jesus gathered his 12 and he took them to an upper room. And he girded himself with a towel. And he washed their feet. And as Peter says, be clothed with humility, I think in his mind is he's seeing his Lord clothed with the humility of a servant as Jesus got down on the ground with a basin and began washing the disciples' feet. He made his way all the way around the table. Now, none of them, 
offered to do this. They should have done this for him, but but they were all fussing and fighting as to who was the lowest, I'm sure. This is this is their constant argument. Who's greatest? Who's going to sit on the right and the left of Jesus and all these things, right? They want to be somebody. They're ambitious for the kingdom. They want to be have these prominent positions. They get their mama to come and lobby for them. James and John do. But Jesus modeled for them. He says, he says, loving his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end. And he he took off his garments and he clothed himself with a towel. In other words, he dressed himself like a servant, got down on the floor and began washing their feet. And when he came to Peter, Peter said, Lord, you are not going to wash my feet. I mean, it just crushed Peter to see his Lord do this. And he said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. He said, well, then wash the whole thing. He said, well, you're already clean, but but not your feet. In other words, in other words, you, you, you need to let me, I'm going to minister to you in this because and you need to continually let me minister to you. You're saved, Peter, but you still walk through the old dirty streets of this world. And so he says, all of you <clears throat> be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. When you think about about pride and humility, I want you to remember King Uzziah. And I want you to remember the day that he went too far. That he was bowed up with pride. He was strong and powerful. And, you know, this this king, the, the, the word spread about this king far and wide, far beyond Judah. People had heard about how mighty and powerful and cunning in battle and, and, and you know, just, just how uh, uh, influential this guy was. And boy, it just all went to his head. And it's interesting to me that that's where the leprosy started. And that big, fat head. Bam! And God said, if you won't humble yourself, I will humble you. And can you imagine this king and all that he did for the rest of his, his time as king? He had to hide. He couldn't, he couldn't have court. He couldn't go to the temple and worship. He couldn't go to be with his family. He had to, Jotham, his son, would have to come probably and and holler at him, hey, dad, we're doing this, we're doing that. I mean, how much influence can you have? You can tell him what to do, but basically Jotham, uh, he takes over the kingdom at that point in time. And God humbled that man greatly. So this is your choice. And and if, if God loves you, he'll do it. If God loves you, he'll take you to the woodshed. If you can get away with it, you don't belong to him. But this is your choice. You can either humble yourself or God can humble you. And I don't want that. (laughs) I know you don't either. And so I just want to encourage you. Humble yourselves. Learn the lesson of King Uzziah. Pride is a killer. It's It's a destroyer. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this study and King Uzziah's life. And uh, God, help us to, to rely upon you, to come to you humbly, Lord, and to rely upon you and to realize every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord, and we owe you all gratitude. We owe you all worship. Everything we have comes from you. God, there's no place for pride in our lives because because we are recipients. You're the one who gets the glory. You're the one who gets all of the praise and all of the laud. And God, help us always to remember that. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who takes your word and applies it to our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Glad you're here.